Good afternoon and welcome to this session. Great debate. Is the term microbiome drug development now passe? My name is Kane Akai. I'm one of the senior healthcare analysts here at Chardon. Joining me on the panel are four CEOs from our presenting companies today. Aoife Brennan, President and CEO of Synlogic, Stephanie Culler, co-founder and CEO of Persephone Biosciences, Bernat Allais, CEO of Vendanta Bioscience, and Paul Garafalo, co-founder and chief executive officer of Locus Biosciences. As a reminder to attendees, if you'd like to ask a question of our speakers, please type it into the question box under the video player. The past two years has been a bit of a roller coaster ride for investors in the microbiome medicine sector. In 2020, positive data from Series Phase 3 study in C. diff acted as a rising tide that lifted all boats. Unfortunately, in 2021, some high profile clinical failures gave rise to increased investor skepticism about microbiome medicines. As we've seen in other emerging therapeutic modalities in past years, such as gene therapy, stem cell therapy, and RNA interference, there's initially a lot of hype around new uh, <coughs> modalities, and this can motivate new companies to seek to be associated with this hot new trend. But as the challenge of new drug development sets in, a lot of those same companies will seek to distance themselves from the bandwagon. In the second half of 2021, we certainly saw companies in the sector appropriately step up their efforts to explain how their programs were different than those that failed. The reality is that microbiome medicines is an emerging and evolving sector. There were in fact a number of positive clinical outcomes reported in 2021. There's also an increasing number of publications that describe causality. Finally, as we've seen from today's discussions thus far, there's a, a diverse set of design approaches being pursued, a number of which are quite far afield from a donor-derived FMT that seeks to address a dysbiosis, which is the description by which many investors were first introduced to microbiome medicines. Our four CEO panelists are leading companies that each have different design approaches. So let's get started. Bernard, you get to uh, lead off here. A lot of early work in the field was focused on donor-derived FMT consortia products, and hence this might be considered as a first-generation design approach. Vendanta has pioneered the Rationally Design Consortia product. Can you talk about the advantages of this design approach and how it's allowed you to chip away at a number of the risks associated with the field? So, uh, thanks, Kay. Um... When we were looking at getting involved with the field, my personal view was that um, while using products made from fecal donations was um, clearly a faster way to get to the clinic and get clinical results, uh, in the end, if somebody figured out how to make products that were defined in nature, that obviated the need for a donor, and that those were safer, more scalable, and and had reproducible quality attributes, that that would be ultimately where the field would go. So we decided to basically go a little bit slower at the beginning, figure out some of the technologies that were necessary to rationally pick bacteria and then manufacture them, but ultimately have the ability to make products that are defined in nature. And what we mean by defined um, is that there is no donation of feces involved. You start from coronal cell banks and you use fermentation technology to make live bacteria that go into a product, always the exact same species, always the exact same dose. And by, by doing that, we think we can eliminate the safety risk of transferring pathogens from a donor because there's no donor, have a product that always has the same quality attributes and have a process to make that product that is truly scalable where when you have to go to to launch and to serve broad patient populations, you can actually make enough of it at a reasonable cost of goods to be able to supply the markets. So that's what we've been focusing on. And then we, we've been interested in consortia, uh, realizing as, as you'll see today in the panel that there's other, other approaches that, that have a lot of merit because a lot of what we've learned in the field of microbial ecology points to communities of organisms playing a very important role in dividing labor among them to be able to serve functions that are important in their ecosystems, including the human gut. Uh, 
And so we found that by assembling bacteria in designed communities, you can get better potency outcomes that their the constituents part can can provide. So great. So so IFA, Synlogic's design approach seeks to precisely engineer its live bacteria products to express a desired therapeutic output. Output. This is clearly a rationally designed approach that aims to achieve predictable drug-like properties, but differs in its use of a single strain, which does not engraft. So can you describe the advantages of your approach and for, for which diseases you believe it is and it is not most applicable? Yeah, so I think there's, you know, as you point out in your intro, Kay, there's a lot of parallels between, you know, what we do and what, what Bernat does in terms of really thinking about something that's very defined and very defined in terms of identity, quality and functionality. And rather than using a consortium to achieve you know, sustained functionality and functional benefit for patients, we use genetic engineering and genetic engineering tools to enable us to do that. And I think ultimately the goal is to impact human disease, right? So, so that's very, very similar, I think, across all, all companies here on the panel. Um, what we do is we engineer a, a known strain. So we always are using the same chassis organism. And instead of combining different strains, we're actually combining genetics from different strains in the microbiome. And we've started to use, to develop our platform with validated biology. So, you know, I think, you know, as Bernat pointed out earlier, there's a lot more mechanistic work now going on to really understand the association that had been previously described. And we love that as a company, because I think the more we understand about mechanism, the more we can choose the right platform and the right technologies to pursue specific diseases. And I think we're still probably in the early days of, of being able to kind of match the technology to the disease and to the mechanism in a really optimal way. But once you, you understand that mechanism, what we do is we engineer it into a chassis organism with specific you know, potency because we put these effectors under the control of a specific promoter so that they're kind of switched on all the time as opposed to responding to their environment like a, a, um, a naturally occurring strain might do. And so what we're able to do is we're able to take those known mechanisms and engineer it in to a bacterium. And we're able to leverage a lot of what we already know based on diseases where the microbiome might play a role. I'll give you an example. You know, one of our programs is to treat a disease called enteric hyperoxaluria. We know that there's a big interplay between the microbiome and oxalate levels. We know, for instance, that people who've been treated with a lot of antibiotics have an increased risk of kidney stones. We know that there are specific species in the microbiome that express genetic elements that consume oxalate and that help the host controlling urinary oxalate levels. So that was all amazing you know, data for us, right? So we could then go and say, okay, if we wanted to engineer in an oxalate consuming functionality into a probiotic organism, what would that look like? And we were able to borrow genetic elements from a naturally occurring strain that doesn't have all of the manufacturability and the ability to, to be kind of that drug-like product. We took some of the genetic elements out of that, oxalobacter formigenes, we put them into E. coli nissel, we had to, of course, never as easy as a cut and paste. There are some other tweaks that need to be made. Uh, but we were able to generate a strain that had similar activity to Oxalobacter formigenes, but now is able to function constitutively at a much higher potency. We're able to manufacture it at scale. So we can scale up. We know E. coli nissel grows very well in a fermenter and performs very well in terms of downstream myophilization. And we're able to administer that chronically back to patients with disease in order to address their elevated oxalate levels. So that's kind of how our approach works. It starts with understanding mechanism. And, you know, I think that's something that, um, you know, as a field, the more we can understand about the underlying disease biology and the specific role that's being played by the bacteria that live in and on us, around us, I think the more successful we'll be as, as a group. Great. So, Paul, I think uh, our, our listeners appreciate that phage are the natural enemy of bacteria and they've evolved together. But the idea of swapping out native phage DNA and leveraging its exquisite specificity as a delivery vector for CRISPR machinery is an entirely, entirely different innovative way to precisely engineer a microbe focused product. Can you describe the Lotus design approach or Locus design approach? Sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm happy to contribute here, and thanks for having us, Gay. Um, 
So locusts is in the business of precisely removing bacteria. And I think if you look at SynLogic and Vedanta and locusts, I think we're all stewards of the, a new precise approach for microbiome optimization. So that we have in common, I think where the platform at Locust differs is that we essentially engineer phage to carry CRISPR-Cas3 enzymes to selectively remove targeted bacteria. And so we have actually had some recent breakthroughs in, in actually adding nanobodies uh, into the payloads for phage. And so our view of how our platform of engineered phage can be used moving forward is to take an area like, let's say, ulcerative colitis. Um, there may be a number of pathobionts you want to get out of the human body because you believe the immune system is attacking those. We uh, selectively remove those first, get those out of the body and try to essentially signal a, a different response from the immune system. And then we send in essentially things like anti-TNF alpha loaded uh, bacteriophage to essentially leverage bacteria that's blooming right where you would find the inflammation in the intestines um, where you'd want that um, nanobody to essentially express itself. And so uh, our approach is, is definitely different. Uh, the idea of using bacteriophage and engineered bacteriophage to remove targets prior to actually then delivering alternative payloads. We think that two-step process is, is key um, to the future of the space, but I, I think we applaud anyone who's attempting a, a microbiome therapy that's using precise techniques. Um, I think we've seen some of these mistakes in other modalities before where broad spectrum approaches are, are pretty uncontrollable and, and maybe not so predictable, especially in, in areas that, sort of in the fecal space around manufacturing. So I think there's, there's a lot of advantages to the approaches that you've heard today uh, on, on this panel. And, and we certainly hope to be able to contribute to the field um, with our approach as well. Great. So Stephanie, as the earliest stage company within this group, how have the successes and failures by other in the field, others in the field influenced your design approach? And what are you trying to do differently at Persephone? Absolutely. We really think we are with everybody and standing on the shoulders of all the pioneers in our space and, and taking all of those wins and, and failures in, into account. We design our technology platform. Um, you know, I am a chemical engineer and so is my co-founder. And when we entered this space, I asked one fundamental question. What, how can we come up with design principles? How can we understand the mechanism behind how the gut microbiome impacts our immune system, overall health, as well as other aspects that we're focused on at Persephone, like treatment response. And so we decided that the way towards that, I think that's one of our differentiators that we're building upon here, is that we are starting with patient data first. We're just we're di discovering biomarkers from human-derived data such that we can de develop all of our therapeutics based on those targets, as opposed to potentially starting with preclinical animal models for evaluation of mechanism or discovery of, of their of, you know, bacterial targets. Um, and in our approach, um, it matters on scale. You know, we've, we've looked at hundreds of, of patients um, in our studies, and I'll talk more about that. But what we found is that we need a lot more data than that um, to really drive biomarker discovery and development. Um, and so I think where we have focused um, is trying to, one, discover what are the biomarkers. Biomarkers are complex in our field. They're not just microbial signatures. They're also metabolites. They're also proteins. They're a combination of all of these different factors. Um, and then also, how do we think about translation? You know, animal models have been, um, are, are not maybe the easiest to work with in terms of microbiome. So how can we potentially expand that as well? So we've We've been thoughtful kind of at all prongs of, of, the, of our platform, given, given the successes and failures in our space to date. Great. So a major challenge that's often cited for the field at this stage is the need to advance from current knowledge about correlation and association to causality and translation of this into validated disease targets um, is an important consideration that handicaps early probability of success in the clinic. We've seen this with other emerging therapeutic modalities. For gene therapy, this means targeting monogenic diseases. For RNAi, uh, it's gain or loss of function mutations. So can each of you talk about how 
this consideration is factoring into your disease target selection. And Paul, let me start with you. Why did you choose UTI and E. coli as your first target to achieve proof of concept for your platform technology? Well, I, I think one, it wasn't a microbiome target that had a, 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 let's say a constellation target space that was maybe not agreed to. Um, so it, in my mind, creating a, a target that was a, a singular pathogenic threat um, created the question of, of, you know, are you choosing the right target? And it takes it out of play. And so when you look at recurrent urinary tract infections, um, I think it, it, there's a couple of things to understand. So the first is 80% of recurrent urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli. So the notion of hitting the right target uh, patient population, both in a clinical design, um, as well as a, a commercial market that's sizable enough, um, was actually hit dead center. And uh, just to support that, so there's about 1.8 million recurrent UTI infections in the world, 80% of which are um, E. coli. And so I think all of us, when we have these new modalities and these new platforms, your first real step is clinical proof of efficacy um, that's statistically powered. So you have to choose your target quite wisely. And it's got to be a balance of um, commercial viability to attract investors. It needs to be, uh, I think, clinically feasible to get the actual trial done. And then I think you also have a, a technical feasibility that you need to go through to make sure you can actually build the asset. And when those three worlds combine, um, you've landed yourself with, with a target. For us, the other consideration with E. coli, especially thinking about using phage as uh, a syringe to inject various payloads into the human body, E. coli is one of the most abundant bacteria that exists in the human body. And so being able to leverage that um, as essentially an amplification vehicle um, really did create, I think, a backbone target for, for our platform. So that, you know, the, the reason we chose that was uh, half defensive strategy and, and half offensive strategy um, to make sure that we could, we could win and, and, and get you know, statistical proof of efficacy for the platform. And then our, our plan is, of course, to leverage that E. coli vessel and expand out into any number of targets. Um, and per my earlier comment, ulcerative colitis is certainly the first on our list for immunology. So Aoife, uh, your, your initial targets of PKU and EH, you know, these are diseases in which the biology is well validated due to exclusion diets. So, you know, these are, these seem to be very good choices. Um, should these development efforts prove to be successful, how would you move your platform beyond these in a similar informed way? Yeah, so I think you're exactly right. I mean, the reason that we chose PKU and um, enteric hyperoxaluria was because we know from humans, we're not reliant on animal models, but we know from human experiments that if you reduce the phenylalanine in a patient with PKU in their diet, you're going to impact blood fee levels, you're going to improve outcomes. Very well established kind of canon of, of medicine. So that made us feel like, okay, what well, the, the, the uh, assumption we're making is that removing phenylalanine using a bacterial mechanism is going to be similar to an exclusion diet. So therefore we should be able to have an impact on, on clinical outcomes. And that really reduced a lot of the complexity for us in terms of thinking about the initial applications and, and similarly with, with um, hyperoxyuria. So I think, you know, as I think about developing platform technologies, I think about kind of dancing right in a tango. You always want to start moving to a new area with one foot on the ground. So you're constantly trying to move, use what you've learned from your current um, programs to move into an area that's slightly adjacent, but into, into a new field. So that you're not completely starting de novo in a completely new area of technology risk, a completely new area of biological risk. You're constantly kind of pivoting to, to new areas and broadening where you're looking. And so based on the data we shared last September, we now know that we can engineer bacterium to consume metabolite in the GI tract and we can have an impact on the clinical endpoint in that disease. 
But I think that was a really important learning for us and a really important pivot point for us as a company, because that made us think like, okay, what are the other diseases where there's a metabolite in the GI tract that's driving the disease pathophysiology? And some of those it will be well established from a, an exclusion diet. Others, maybe we may be taking on a little bit more biology risk. But now we've de-risked the technology, right? So we know that we can consume that toxin in a way that's clinically meaningful. And the, the, the new risk we're taking on as well is that toxin really driving the disease endpoint. So there are multiple different diseases, be they inborn errors of metabolism or acquired immune or metabolic diseases, where we know there's an important metabolite that's either originates in the gut or transits through the gut. And I think that provides us with a world of opportunity to think about as we expand beyond kind of our consumption of toxins in monogenic diseases into other areas where our platform could be applied. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very exciting space and, and that's how we plan to continue to advance the platform. So Bernard, a similar question for you, you know, recurrent C. diff has a well-described bad actor that's gone rogue. And so addressing this imbalance is a validated target. How do you move forward in a more informed way in diseases that are more multifactorial like IBD, UC? Yeah, CDP is multifactorial, but certainly IBD is, um, has the added level of complexity of the engagement of a, of a chronic immune response. It's, so your your question on validation validation of targets and correlation and causation beyond the obvious no CDPCL is appropriate because there's a lot of disease areas where the microbiome has has been described as playing some role and then we're left with making decisions of which of those raise to the level where that role is indeed underlied by causation and where the effect size of an intervention is big enough to make a difference for the patient population. And so uh, in IBD, we're following the exact same textbook that we followed for CD seal. There's two, two pieces of information that we wanted to have by the time we would go into the clinic. First, we wanted to know that intervening in this patient population by changing the microbiota was effective. And both in the case of CDPCL and in the case of ulcerative colitis, one of the, the forms of IBD, there have been many studies with FMT showing efficacy. In both cases, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, there's been 75. So there's been 75 studies of FMT in CDIV, 75 in IBD. It's not that people just like to do the same thing over and over again. They're doing it because it works. And in both cases, there's now been multiple randomized control studies um, showing effect sizes that are either superior to standard of care in the case of CDFACIL or comparable to the best performing biologics but with a better safety profile in the case of colitis with FMT. So, th so that data gives us confidence that if you manipulate the microbiota in these patient populations, it makes a difference and that difference is big enough for the GIs or the ID docs to care. And the second piece of evidence that we wanted to know was to have a better, a better understanding that indeed what we were seeing was causation. And some of, some of the animal models that uh, Eva started to describe are very useful for that. So doing gain of function or loss of function experiments in the microbiome is the perfect tool to understand causation. You can start with germ-free animals that don't have a community, add one and see if you gain a phenotype. We can start with animals that have a community, ablated with antibiotics and see if you lose that phenotype. So for CD facile, you know, if you don't have a microbiota in germ-free animals, or if you ablate it with antibiotics, you become vulnerable to infection with C. difficile. And if you, re if you reintroduce a community, you regain colonization resistance. In IBD, we know from, from uh, mouse models also of, of microbiome work that introducing certain communities of bacteria can trigger inflammation and start the IBD cascade. And vice versa, that the IBD cascade in turn can change the compositions of bacteria, right? So in both cases, we felt we had very good clinical evidence that that patient population could benefit and good animal evidence that pointed to causation in some mechanisms. Um, and I think that as the field evolves, you will see other indications uh, that will follow the same path. You know, if, if you look at the trends in FMT studies in graft versus disease, in infections by some gram negatives, 
you're starting to see some of these early studies with meaningful effect sizes that then years, a few years later turn into randomized control studies that, that uh, capture the attention of the field. You will see more indications that, that fit that bill. And you will also see many of the indications that are being pursued that turn out to be more noise than, than signal. So Stephanie, the field is trying to narrow in on this answer to the question about correlation and causality as it pertains to the microbiome impact on patient responses to immunotherapies. So as you capture more patient data, you have uh, identification of better biomarkers. You know, how do you eventually, you know, draw this line or close this loop about causality, especially, you know, when we think about possible um, uh, responses being stimulation of, of the T cell and enhancing its responses to uh, microbial antigens, whether it's TLR activation or small metabolites that mediate systemic effects on the host. So, you know, how, how do you get to this answer as you capture your data and eventually enter the clinic? Absolutely. So from our data, you know, we're collecting stool and blood samples. So we're really trying to understand aspects of the function of the microbiome, but also the immune system. And then depending on the particular indication in oncology, we do try to get tissue samples to kind of complement that. But all of the omics done on those data sets are meant to kind of derive at specific mechanisms. Is it metabolites mostly you know, um, driving the impact from the microbiome? Is it also peptides, for example? What are the different um, features that we're seeing from the data sets that we think play a role in the mechanism. And then it comes down to having good preclinical um, in vivo models. Um, and that's where we've been um, working really um, heavily and focused on trying to identify those particular aspects of mechanism. You know, can we start to see the same biomarkers we've discovered in the human data? How does that play out in these animal models and vice versa, as well as developing out in vitro assays that help recapitulate that we're still in the early stages, but that's essentially our focus. Okay, so beyond the need to understand uh, causality, what other issues are companies in the microbiome medicine sectors facing right now? And let, let me ask this of Paul and Aoife. So Paul, you wanna start? Well, I think funding is probably the one that's probably at the tip of most people's tongue. Um, although I, I must say, after spending seven years in infectious disease, it, it feels like a cakewalk on the microbiome side. Um, but I think, I think if you want my personal opinion, we see a lot more interest from strategics than I think any venture groups um, would anticipate. And I think the deal flow that's been inside of microbiome, if you're watching carefully, would, would really lead you to believe that the strategics know this is the next field of medicine and there are bets to be placed. Some are gonna work and some are not, but there's bets to be placed and compiling the right platforms together is at least from what I can see what the strategics are trying to do. And honestly, um, I think the failure from the series last year creates a target rich environment for those of us that are in this space. Um, I'm hoping you see some pretty creative moves in 2022 and 2023, because it would seem to me that figuring out the link between bacteria and human disease is something we don't understand in science. And whoever figures that out is gonna crack open a brand new field in our space. So it's exciting times if you're willing to go through the, the pain and punishment of advancing a new modality, uh, like those of us you have on this call. So Eva, same same question. What other current issues are companies facing? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's the usual. You know, any biotech company is going to face challenges in the current environment. I do think there's an additional one that I think will be solved in the short term, which is how a regulatory agency is going to regulate these products from an approval perspective, right? So I think the first couple of products that get through that takes away a lot of the skepticism about, you know, is this a science experiment or is it a true novel treatment modality that's relevant commercially for patients? I think all it takes is one or two approvals for people to say, okay, there is a path here, right? Regulators know how to think about things. They know how to think about manufacturability. They know how to regulate these products from a quality perspective. And that's the other thing I think that could really put wind in the sails of this, of this space is taking away some of that kind of regulatory overhang by having one or two products get through the, the pipeline. Okay, so for 
for Nat and Stephanie. What do you think is most poorly understood currently by investors interested in the microbiome medicine sector? So, Bernat. That's a good segue from your previous question of challenges to the level of understanding that um, the average investor has of the field is very superficial. I'm, I'm not going to make ma many friends with, with, with investor audience, but I think you know, just, just to give a more charitable uh, interpretation of that, you know, investors have very limited time and bandwidth. Everybody wants a piece of their time. And naturally they're more willing to spend time learning about a new complex field and ours is if somebody else has already made money. And unfortunately investors, uh, at least public investors haven't made money in the field to date. And so that's a problem. It's a problem for all of us. On top of that, having folks that understand microbial ecology among uh, investment firms is very, very rare. Um, even microbiology is relatively rare. And so as a consequence of that, I think you have a disconnect between the potential of the field as evidenced by all the clinical work that I was, that I was outlining in the previous question and the investment flows that you're seeing right now. And, and I think, um, you know, part of the issue is that, you know, with their limited time, investors can evaluate one or two companies. Um, and a lot of the attention in the field has gone, has gone to some of the early entries in the public markets, but maybe not so much the broader field. Um, and I think that as additional success as a crew, what, what I would expect to see is that you start seeing more investment firms deciding that it's worth their time becoming experts in the field and maybe bringing some young associates that did their PhD or their postdocs in the microbiome field who actually can put on the spot and ask us the really hard questions, the questions that should be being asked, right? Um, I think today, sometimes you see this very monolithic treatment uh, where some investors will say, well, this company makes their products of bacteria and they failed. Your products are bacteria too, so you're gonna fail, right? And and like, <laughs> you know, you would never hear an investor say, "So and so has a small molecule that fit for, fail for cancer." You have a small molecule, so that would fail too, right? It's like, no, it depends on what groups you have on the uh, on the scaffold that's gonna determine the toxicity and the specificity. Well, for us, it depends on what bacteria you're giving. They have completely different properties, right? But many people won't even know the difference between a pharmacute and a bacteria, right? And so you, you need to bring some expertise so that you can even ask the, the right questions about why do you think your specific composition of bacteria is the right composition for that specific use, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's on us to continue to generate the positive clinical data that brings the field to the point where investors think this is worth my time. Great. Uh, Stephanie, what would you add to that? Um, I, I agree <laughs> with Bernard's comments. I think the only thing I would add is, you know, obviously, yes, lack, lack of um, background and experience in, in our space. Um, the key challenge that we have seen investors is that they have a problem understanding the difference between all of the companies in our space. And there's a lot of companies. And I find them often putting us all into the same bucket and comparing us to what Bernard mentioned, some of the key challenges are failures in this space and not being able to separate us. And so we, we have to help educate the field, but to, to Bernard's point, we also need to make sure that investments firms, if they're really interested in our space, to bring on the you know, kind of expertise internally. Great. So, you know, typically clinical data and investments collaborations and acquisition by big pharma and initial product approvals are the typical catalyst for emerging sectors. So over the next 12 to 24 months, how do each, you, each of you believe these will prove to increase investor interest in the sector? Paul, let me start with you. Well, we, I guess we have the telltale sign, right? We're about to go into an 800 plus person uh, phase, uh, phase two, phase three, if we're able to combine it correctly here, uh, efficacy trial. We have a um, open label front side of that study that's a PK uplift that's going straight right at the heart of acute patients. And 
I mean, I think the answer is pretty simple. Okay, you need data um, and you need clinical data and it needs to be statistically powered. And, um, you know, I would say most of, well, certainly Synlogic and, and Vedanta are ahead of us in that respect. And so for us, um, once we have that data in hand, if that data is positive, I think the whole field opens up for us. Um, I don't think it gets much more complicated than that. I think you have to do what the regulatory authorities ask you to do, and you got to prove statistical power. And if you can do those things, you have a platform. And uh, the next steps are additional assets that come in behind uh, the lead asset on that platform. Um, I think you'll see a lot of that in the coming in the coming year. I would add, if you look at the precision approaches of the at least the current group of people on this phone uh, or this uh, panel, but also sort of emerging trends in, in microbiome. Certainly the fecal transplant approaches of old, uh, the sort of broad spectrum, just maybe carpet bomb the target uh, is giving way to precise approaches, whatever that precision is. I think if you look at trends in other fields of medicine, I think you'll see that the precision approach has much more promising uh, possibilities. Stephanie, what would you add? Um, for us, we, we're aiming in this time period to be in the clinic um, for our first to, to, to clinic candidate in oncology. Um, but we are also um, like to expand our pharma partnerships. We have several um, right now that we've announced, several in the pipeline, and want to continue to partner with pharma in other indications on our large scale observational studies. And now, Seeing the time frame you laid out, you, you may see uh, the first approval of a donor-derived um, fecal-based product in CD Facile. It's a possibility. I'm obviously not putting words on the mouth of the FDA. Um, and TBD, what effect will that have on pharma? I mean, Nestle stepped in to get the, the rights to the, to the series product, um, but to see how, how the rest of the pharma views it was the field. Um, but uh, certainly as, as you look into the next wave of, of readouts in IBD, that's a different, that's a different um, ballpark for pharma because there's, there's many pharmaceutical companies that have very well established franchises there. So right. in 22, 23, you can start seeing data from some of the first defined approaches in IBD. That's gonna be an interesting measure. Uh, and, and pharma certainly will look at companies, but we look, we look at the academic literature because there's so much more clinical work that's being done by folks that you know, don't have a company. They're just like an, an investigator doing an ISD or, or um, academic studies. And you know, right now there's three, 300 studies of FMT across a myriad of indications. We look at this data all of the time because that's where we get, where we get signal. And I'm sure that in this time period, you're going to see new indications emerge with, with promise. <clears throat> Eva. Yeah, so I think just building on what everyone said, I completely agree with Paul. It's clinical data. It's clinical data that's believable, that's not phenomenology, that's going to really drive interest. And I think as a company, we have kind of three things to do this year. Number one is, you know, show that we can do it with our build on our PKU data that we announced last September with additional data and show that we have a path to phase three. The second thing is show that we have a product engine so that we don't just do it once, we actually can do it multiple times. And we have three clinical programs with three dates this year. So that will kind of, we're on track to address that second thing. And then the third thing that I think is important for all companies is to show that we're not just doing something because we can, we're doing something because it's an actual need. So that there really is a segment that this new treatment modality is going to address in a really unique way, right? That there's a need, there's a problem that we're aiming to solve that, you know, makes it worth the overcoming all the, the pain and suffering of developing a new treatment modality, because you can do something that's really unique for patients and patients that are not served by currently available modalities, be it small molecules or, or protein biologics. And I think that's something that as a group, we can all do much better, right? Is to really be able to articulate what this product, not just the science of the product, but what this is going to mean for an actual patient with the disease. And I think if we can do a better job of that, then I think it makes people kind of more willing to do the hard work of understanding the underlying science. You know, the gene therapy programs can use cure. That's like one word, 
it encapsulates really well what you're going to do for a patient with disease, right? And there's all kinds of technical challenges, but you know, that's the aim. I think we need to do a good job of really uh, communicating what it is we're solving for patients, what that patient is going to experience, what our value propositions that patient is at the end of the day, because patients get it, right? They like the gut restricted approach. They kind of get the safety element, but I just don't think we have communicated that effectively enough. And we're leading too much with the science and not enough with the actual patient value proposition. And I think that's the third thing we need to do as a company in order to, uh, to have a super successful year. Okay, final question. And this is just to tie the discussion back to our title, which admittedly was meant to be provocative. Do you believe that the therapeutics that you are developing are best described as microbiome medicines, Bernard? Yes, they are. You can, uh, uh, you, you can change the name and call it somebody else. I'm sorry, call it something else. I think this is how you started the, the discussion today, right? You know, the times when the field is hot, everybody wants to use the word microbiome. The times when it's not hot, find creative ways to not use the word. But we are microbiome medicine developers, right? And I think that running away from that and using other terminology is just assuming that investors are stupid and they're not. <laughs> they see through that from miles away, so. Deepa. Yeah, you know, I think microbiome is a term that started off as a very scientific term that became loaded with all kinds of concepts that are now completely divorced from the original scientific meaning. And, you know, I think the science is based on the microbiome, the science, but we shouldn't be defined by the products that we're developing more so than that underlying science. And that's a sign that the field is maturing, right? When investors and others externally start to talk about more the products and the value proposition, as I've mentioned for patients, and less about, you know, where the idea, the origination of your uh, target effector came from. I think that's when we'll know that we've really matured as a field because, you know, Bernat, what you think about as microbiome may be completely different to, you know, the kind of meaning that's attributed to that word by, by somebody else. So I, I just feel like our communications need to become far more product focused and far more nuanced. Stephanie. We completely agree with both Bernard and Ipa. Um, you know, we are developing microbiome medicines, but to that point, we've been trying to get really product focused and how can we really be specific about what we're developing? And I think as we approach the clinic and start to think about that, that's when, when we'll probably come up with some, some, you know, better terminology, but us as a field have to start thinking about that and maybe collectively developing terminology that's appropriate. Paul, final word on this. Well, I, I think we're a unique bird. We clearly have infectious disease assets and uh, are working to try to get into this microbiome field. Um, so maybe a little bit unique of a story, but I mean, frankly, I think anything that takes a bacterial approach, approach to therapeutics is tagged as microbiome. And, and frankly, I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I think it's uh, investors are smart enough to dig behind the covers if they want to and look for um, you know, high value assets to invest in. So I see a bright future because I see a lot of strategic interest and in usually venture follows strategics. Well, great. Uh, this has been a great session. Thank, thank you so much for, for participating. Thanks, Gay. Thank, thank you. you.